Good morning, Virginia. This is WGFW 88.7 on the FM dial, Drake's Branch, Virginia. The time is 9.15. This is Storytime, brought to you by Safe Haven Ministries. I am your host, Brother D. As always, let us begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for our safe travels. We are grateful for all that you've given us, the blessings that we've enjoyed throughout the week. Father, we ask that you open our hearts, our minds, and our eyes as we get ready to bring forth today's stories. Father, we are grateful for the greatest gift you ever gave the world, your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name I pray. Amen. Die, brother D. What are we going to do today? What are we going to do today? Dog, calm down. We got the last chapter of Montana Bullwhacker with Pastor Brian. I told you that. Uh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. That that, that you did. I, I I'm just I'm just so excited to be on the radio as always. Dog, would you just calm down? We're going to get there. All right. Uh, okay. Yeah. What? Well, but I know you got something else. You 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 were talking about earlier. That's right, dog. There's a story about a man who was basically the janitor or keeper of a little park in a city. He was sweeping one day and sweeping the sidewalks and around an alley and everything. And he happened to notice that there was a little girl sitting at a picnic table. Now he kind of kept his eye on her and everything because he didn't see any adults. And after a little while, he finally went over and he asked her her name. And she looked up at him and smiled. And she says, my name's Meg. And he goes, well, Where's your mommy? She said, well, mommy had a job interview across the street. She told me to wait here. She'd be right back. Well, Howard kept an eye on her. He he, he just couldn't understand why anybody would leave the little girl alone and everything. And just about the time his shift was ending, he finally realized that Meg had been sitting there all day, all alone and everything. And he went up to her and she's like, uh, mommy will be here very shortly I and everything. So he was a little reluctant, but he went on home that night. But he was thinking to himself, he'd really love to have a little girl like Meg in his life. You see, Albert's daughter and son-in-law and granddaughter had all been killed just a couple of years before in a terrible car accident. And he was very lonely because he had no other family and everything. But when he went back the next morning and everything and started working on cleaning up around the park area and everything, he happened to glance over at that same picnic table and there sat little Meg all by herself. So he went up and he asked her, he says, Meg, what are you doing by yourself? Where's your mommy? She says, mommy didn't come home. And he looked at her and he says, your mommy didn't come home. She didn't come back. Where did you sleep? The little girl looked at him and goes, at home. And he's like, well, maybe you better take me to your house. Let's let's see if your mommy's there now. So Meg led him back into the park to a little secluded bridge and everything. And she went up under the bridge. And when Albert got to looking, there was a tarp tent that had been stretched out up under the bridge. And Meg said, this is home. This is where we live. And Albert just couldn't believe it. He looked there. He says, this is your home? She Meg looked at him and she had tears in her eyes. She says, we had a big house once, but he, some very mean men come and told mommy she had to get out all because of money and, and everything. And we, we live here now. And Albert's like, well, maybe you better come home with me and everything. And we'll see if we can find your mommy. So Albert, when he finished his shift, he took the little girl home with him. And he sat down, he started calling all of his friends on the police force. He started calling all of his friends with fire and EMS. Nobody knew anything about the little girl or her mother. There was no missing children's report. Well, Albert brought her back every day to the park and set her down at the little picnic table where he first found her. And he kept an eye on her all the time. And as soon as he finished work, he'd take her back home. And he never give up trying to find her mommy. Well, after a couple, three weeks and everything, they were getting off the bus and getting ready to cross the street heading for the park 
when Meg grabbed his hand real hard and started pointing, said, there's mommy, there's mommy, and turned around, and Albert looked up, and there was a billboard, and it had a picture of a woman that says, do you know me? Call this number. Well, Albert instantly pulled out his phone, and he called the number, and was greeted with City Hospital. Now, once he explained why he was calling, he was put in touch with a nurse. And the nurse said, yes, she was admitted here and everything, but nobody knew her name. Said she was in a traffic accident. She come in with a head injury and had amnesia. Says we didn't know what else to do after she was released. So we set her up in a homeless shelter and everything. And the nurse gave the address for the homeless shelter. Well, Albert took Meg and... He called in and told him he wasn't coming to work that day. He had other things to do. And he carried Meg down to the shelter. And as soon as they even went in, there was Candace, Meg's mom, at the end of the room, sitting on the edge of a bed. And she was staring at something in her hand. Well, Meg ran to her just as fast as her little legs would carry her, screaming, Mommy, Mommy, Mommy. Candace looked up. She looked down at the photo. She couldn't remember anything else, but she did remember her little girl. Now, Albert felt so sorry for him, and he got to talking to Candace, and he told her that he had a place for her and Meg to stay as long as they needed. So he took Candace and Meg home. Albert paid for all Candace's hospital bills. He paid for everything to, for her to get well. Then, when it was all over, he helped her to find a job, and then he helped her to find a place of her own and every day. But here's the thing. Candace and Meg basically became Albert's family. They've come to visit him every weekend, and they were constantly there during all the holiday seasons. Duh. Yeah, he, 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 did, he did real good, didn't he, Brother Day? That's right, dog. You see, he took, he took the words of Jesus to his heart. He saw a need. He filled that need. He saw that somebody was really in trouble. And even when he had reunited the little girl and her mother, he showed the kindness that a Christian should show. He took them into his home. Like the good Samaritan, he paid her hospital bills. He, he basically got her back on her feet and everything. And in return, her and little Meg became his family. So you see, when we do good, God will bless us for it. <clears throat> Excuse me, folks. Duh, that's one of the things, brother D, and, and everything. And, and, you know, but he imagine if, if he had if he hadn't looked out for that little girl in today's world. Imagine what could have happened to her. You're right, dog. That's one of the things. You know, it's not a safe place out here in the world. When you see something that's not right, and you know something's wrong, stop and check. Don't just walk by. Don't be like the Levi. Don't be like the priest who turned and walked down the other side of the road when they saw the injured man. Be like the good Samaritan. Stop and see what help you can offer. Die. And look, it's time for Pastor Brian. And here he comes with chapter 14 of Montana Bullwhacker. Chapter 14. At evening, time light. One morning, Lisha woke up so discouraged that after breakfast and chores, he went to the bedroom and lay down on the bed. He wondered how he could manage with all his problems. He had borrowed money to enlarge his livery stable. Now the note would come due in a few days, and he didn't have the money. Chad came in and found him. She looked him over with a worried expression on her face. What's the matter, Alicia? Are you sick? Everything's gone wrong, he said. Money problems, big ones, and on top of that, you want to join the Adventist church. For a moment, Chat did not speak. Alicia tried to read her thoughts. She looked so serious and yet so calm. Maybe I shouldn't join the church. With a rush of tenderness, Alicia remembered that Chat had never opposed him, had always done what he wanted. He threw his arms around her. 
Chat, don't ever let anyone stand between you and your convictions, not me or anyone else. The meetings came to a close. Alicia went willingly to witness the baptism in the creek at old by old Fort Ellis. Chad and three of his children, Pearl, Claude, and Ruby, followed their Lord's example and received baptism that day. Alicia watched Chad's face as she rose from the water and thought he had never seen it so beautiful. Mrs. Reynolds met her at the water's edge and embraced her with tender kisses and weeping. Lisha led his family away to the warm clothes he had ready for them. In the days that followed, Lisha thought about baptism. Somehow he felt that he had made his discovery of God and had accepted him on that anthill in the Sioux camp so long ago. He had never doubted God since that night. He surely didn't need any church to bind him to God. The cords were already strong and true. Now it seemed to Lisha that everything moved faster. The children grew so rapidly. Charlie went away from home to work. And Lee went into Bozeman to stay with Uncle Elliot and Aunt Susan and attend high school there. Elliot still held to his infidel beliefs and often talked to Lee about them. The boys' science study at high school, together with Uncle Elliot's persuasion, influenced Lee. Lisha and Chat could see it, could both see it. One weekend when Lee came home, he tried to show his mother why she must be mistaken about her new religion. Mama, how old is the earth? About 6,000 years since God fitted it up for man at creation. She studied his face. Why do you ask? Well, you see, science has proved that it is much older. Lee gathered enthusiasm as he talked. Actually, the Bible has been discovered to be only a collection of myths and folklore. Chat sat down stunned, not because she had no answer for Lee's argument, but because her precious son had already embraced his Uncle Elliot's infidel beliefs. Lee stood looking at her. Did he mistake her shocked silence for confusion? Just give me one of those Advent books of yours, he said. I'll study it, and I'll come back and tell you how wrong they are. Without answering any of his arguments, Chat stepped to the bookcase and selected Thoughts on Daniel and the Revelation by Uriah Smith. She handed it to him. Now, Lee, if you can honestly think, after reading this book, that the Bible is only folklore, I will have nothing further to say. But be sure to return the book soon. Your father has been studying it, and he will want it back. Thank you, Mother. Lee made ready to depart. I'll bring it back in a week or so. Days passed, weeks passed, months, a month passed. Then one day, a chat stopped Lee. When are you going to bring my book back? Do I have to bring it back so soon, Mother? He smiled down at her. I find it most interesting, and I'd like to keep it a while longer. More weeks passed. What could Lee be doing with that book? Lisha and Chat asked that question often. Then one Friday, Lee came home with the book. He handed it to his mother and said, Mama, I'm ready to join your church. Chat could not speak from astonishment and joy. She threw her arms about her son and wept for gladness. Then Lee explained that he had studied the prophecies of Daniel and the Revelation and could see that God must indeed have shown the prophets Daniel and John the history of the future events that would happen hundreds and thousands of years from their time. Only God could have such foreknowledge. So another one of Lish's children accepted God's truth and joined the church. In 1904, Adventist believers in the Gallatin numbered only a few. Five families lived in Cottonwood Canyon, 20 miles south of Bozeman. Several families lived in Bozeman. 
and Alicia and his family lived at Fort Ellis. The Reynolds family had moved away. All of these people felt a deep concern for their children. Should they not be educated in a church school? They talked it over and decided to rent a house in Bozeman and, and employ a teacher. They <laughs> built a little church, and the following year they moved the school to the church. Building and enlarged it to include 10 grades. 28 children attended school that year. More and more, Lisha found his thinking and his planning shaped by the faith that his family had embraced. He began to extend his vision to the future beyond this life, to the hope of everlasting life. He understood it now. Jesus would confer immortality on his people at his second coming. On the night of the first school program, Lisha and Chad sat together in the audience. Lisha looked around the room and liked what he saw. The students seemed bright and happy. They even acted friendly towards their teachers. His mind went back to his own brief school days. The schoolmaster usually wore out several willow switches every day. The students expected to be cuffed and slapped, or at least wrapped across the knuckles with a ruler. All his young companions had considered the teacher an enemy to be endured or dealt with according to the weapon they possessed. Now he watched the members of the little school orchestra take their places. He listened with surprise and pleasure to the opening number. Lisha glanced around at the audience and saw his own pride and delight mirrored on every face. He sensed that this church school managed children and educated them in a different way from what had he had experienced. On the way home, he told Chat that the school had convic convinced him of the value of Christian education. Lisha often pondered on the strange way he had been led among the many dangers and temptations of his pioneer life, now bound up closely in a family and a community of people who taught temperance and lived by Christian ideals. He saw his children growing up with the influence of the church and the church school strong upon them. Never among all the thrilling adventures and the wild excitements of the gold camps and he felt so much satisfaction. No period of his life had been so blessed. By 1906, the school had grown too large to be accommodated longer in the church building, and the men of the church decided to find larger quarters, land where they could build a permanent school with dormitories for boarding students who lived too far away to drive back and forth every day. They wanted a place in the country where the students could work on a farm and where industries could be developed to assist the students financially, as well as to furnish training in useful skills. Lisha offered them 20 acres of land at half his va its value, and they accepted his offer. So Mount Ellis Academy came into being on the very land where Lisha had taken up his squatter's claim when Bozeman itself was but a dream of brave pioneers. Swifter than a weaver's shuttles, the years fled by. Bozeman had come into good and prosperous times and fulfilled all the expectations that Elliot, John Bozeman, and William Beale had cherished in the days when Indians roamed the wilderness and the land lay in virgin solitude. Elliot's good and generous wife, Susan, passed to her rest. Now Elliot, grown old and lonely, lived by himself in his big brick house. His children had gone to homes of their own. He comforted himself by roving through the streets of Bozeman, marking all the growth and the many surprising developments that took place every year. He seemed to take personal pleasure in the town's prosperity. With pride, he looked on the towering green elevators 
in the humming flower mills, the mention of how he and John Bozeman had persuaded McCods and Cover to invest in the mills in the mills always brought a smile to his lined face, which still retained its early fierceness. The McCod Cover Mill had been the first commercial mill in Montana. The curtain was lowering on the pioneer days in Bozeman. The old actors had passed off the stage. Elliot often walked past their graves in the cemetery, and he knew that he would soon find his place there too. He decided to sell his home in town and spend the remaining years of his life with Lisha and his family at Fort Ellis. The tie between the brothers had always been strong, and never was it more so than now, when Elliot, old, bitter, and lonely, came for comfort to Lish's home. The townspeople had always spoken of the strong resemblance between the Rouse brothers. Now they seemed not at all alike. Elliot smote constantly on his old pipe and drank to excess. These habits, together with his cynical unbelief, made him irritable and cranky. Lisha presented a marked contrast. Firmly situated in the heart of a genuine Christian family, with gentle chat and her sweet influence, always drawing him toward good and better things. With his large family being educated in a Christian school and trained for Christian service, Lisha now enjoyed the golden time of his life. Although not a church member, he took great pride in his children's development and all their plans. He neither smoked nor drank, and he taught his boys the evils of tobacco and liquor. He enjoyed frolicking with his children and taking part in their fun. One hot afternoon in July, Elliot's life ended. He had been helping Lish's boys prepare irrigation ditches when he suddenly, suddenly collapsed from a heart attack. Loving hands laid him to rest beside Susan in Sunset Hill Cemetery, where John Bozeman had been buried so many years before. Elliot had come back to rest at last on the land that he had once been part once had been part of his squatter's claim. Time had left its mark on Lisha and Chat. Now a new generation of youngsters called them Grandpa and Grandma. Like the land whose rugged features civilization had softened, their faces had altered with the years, and their voices had softened and gentled. From the time that Chat had joined the church, she had conducted family worship. Every day the family gathered, and always in the prayers they pleaded for Papa to join them in open acknowledgement of his faith in God and all the church stood for. Yet they attended church and prayer meeting without him. I can't bear to think of your father being taken by a heart attack like Uncle Elliot, Chad said to Pearl one day. It's important to his soul's salvation that he give himself to God openly and join the church. I can't understand it, Pearl said. He seemed the most enthusiastic of all of us when he first heard the truth. Remember how convinced he was about the Sabbath? Early one Sunday evening in 1850, two of Lish's young people, Claude and Ruby, prepared to drive into Bozeman to attend a meeting. R.D. Quinn, a family friend, would speak that evening. Why don't you come with us, Papa? Wouldn't you like to hear Elder Quinn? Ruby had already climbed into the buggy. Elder Quinn? Well, yes, I'd like to hear him, but I'm afraid I'll make you late. We'll wait for you, Claude assured him. Liz, you could see that the family seemed amazed that he would go along to church. He didn't quite know himself why he wanted to go tonight. He got ready, came out, and climbed into the buggy with Claude and Ruby. They drove into Bozeman. Lisha felt that Elder Quinn must have prepared the sermon with him in mind. He felt the drawing power of the Holy Spirit work with mighty effect on his heart and mind. 
The presence he could not explain stirred the deepest level of his soul. Elder Quinn closed his sermon with an appeal to all who accepted Christ as their personal Savior to come forward. Lish arose and went forward to the altar, and a peace he had never before imagined filled his being. At the close of the meeting, he was baptized. Chad and the children rejoiced as only those who have waited long years can rejoice. Now on Sabbath Sabbath mornings, the white-haired patriarch led his family across the road from his house to the chapel at Mount Ellis Academy, where service were, services were conducted. For years, Lisha had lived and worked and survived in the wild and lawless land ruled by the gun and the knife. For many years, he had scouted for the army and taken part in battles with the Indians. For 11 years, he had been a policeman in Bozeman and carried a gun everywhere he went. Many times in his life, he had used the six-gun and the rifle with deadly effect. Now, instead of a gun, an open Bible lay on his lap. He followed the preacher's text with grave interest. Sometimes he caught Chat's affectionate eyes upon him and knew that she compared him to the young and wild Lisha she had married. Then he reached for her hand and smiled at her. Lisha had come to the 75th year of his life when one day Nelson Story came to visit him. The heroic old man was 90 years old. His life also had been filled with adventure. The fame of his cattle drives and his fearless encounter with the wild Indians and wild road agents made the stuff of thrilling stories for the youngsters who sat listening at Grandpa Rouse's home that day. Not many of us old-timers are left, Lesha, Nelson's story said as he left the house. Soon we'll be sleeping out there on the hill with Elliot and John Bozeman and the others. Lesha replied, You know, Nelson, I believe the best is yet to be. About a month after Nelson's last visit, Lisha and Chat arose early one morning. With Lee and Claude, they paused to read Psalm 91 and have prayer. Lee and Claude then hurried away to a neighbor's ranch to fire up the old steam engine and oil the machinery for the day's threshing. After breakfast, Lisha put on his hat and left the house on foot for town. Returning from Bozeman, Lisha passed by the neighbor's place where Lee and Claude were harvesting at the time. The men were washing up for supper after a hard day's work when he arrived. Although urged to stay and eat with the crew, he declined, explaining that he had gone, been gone all day and chat would worry about him. One wonders about his thoughts might have been as he approached the railroad crossing that evening. Gratitude for the golden grain that poured into the wagon box at harvest time. Reminiscence of his counter with Indians only 40 or 50 rods before that crossing. The old lawless days when men like Plummer and Stinson fell into the hands of vigilantes. Engrossed in his thoughts and quite deaf, he watched a freight train pass then stepped in front of an engine on the other track. Years have come and gone since that tragedy. Those who pioneered the West have long since passed away. Elisha's children have scattered. His grandchildren and great-grandchildren have lived in many parts of the world, some serving missionaries, doctors, nurses, teachers, and ministers. But the object for which he labored a settlement in the wilderness of western Montana, where peace, order, and prosperity reigned, has been fully realized. The, we want to thank Pastor Brian for these stories and everything. And uh, <clears throat> That's right. He's getting better, folks, and he thanks you for your prayers. Now then, let us end with a word of prayer. 
Father, we thank you for this day and we thank you for our many blessings. Father, we ask that you be with those that are traveling today. Please keep them safe. As always, Father, we lift up the firefighters, the EMTs, the doctors, nurses, the law enforcement officers who work tirelessly to keep us safe. We also lift up our armed forces that keep us protected so we may worship you as we see fit. Father, as this holiday season approaches, let us remember the true meaning of what Christmas is all about. We are grateful for the greatest gift you ever gave the world, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name I pray. Amen. Duh, folks, if you like what you hear on the radio, you can call us at 434-390-5981. That, that's 434-390-5981. That's right, folks, or you can email us at EMT. Excuse me, folks, that's EMT. X3XL at gmail.com. Again, that's EMTX3XL at gmail.com. As always, folks, we'd like to remind you WGFW is a Christian radio station. It's in need of your support. You hear no advertising on this radio station. Please send your donations to God's Final Call and Warning, P.O. Box 361, Chatham, Virginia 24531. Again, that's God's Final Call and Warning. P.O. Box 361, Chatham, Virginia, 24531. Duh, folks. We we also want to thank Safe Haven Ministries, which have been keeping us on the air and everything. And we thank you all for supporting us and keeping us on the air as well. That's right, folks. And we like to remind everybody, it's Christmas. I issued a challenge last week. I'm going to reissue this challenge. Take the book of Luke. Yes, today's the 10th. There's 24 chapters in the book of Luke. If you haven't started, you've got to catch up. But take a chapter a day until December 24. That way you get to know our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, even better. Once again, folks, this is WGFW 88.7 on the FM dial, Drake's Branch, Virginia. The time is 946. We return you to the regular broadcast. Duh, folks, may your week be blessed.